Richard, and we can go ahead and start this panel. I am so excited for this panel. Um, this is such an exciting group for me because this is where I have spent a lot of time living and currently live. Uh, so we can quickly get to know you because our screen manager is going to be pinning you as we go through this. Oh, and I see a dog too. This is my favorite panel of the night. Uh, first, let us know your name, the council district you're running for, and in five words or less, why you're running for office. Uh, let's start with Jeffrey Omura. Well, hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm Jeffrey Omura, he, him. I'm running for District 6 for City Council, and I'm running to revive New York City's arts and culture sector. Fantastic. Gail Brewer. I'm Gail Brewer, and I'm running for District 6, and the reason I'm running is to make sure that New York comes back with everybody included, not like it was before. All right. Uh, Marty Allen Cumming. Hi, good evening. I'm Marty Allen Cummings. My pronouns are they, them, theirs, and I'm running for uh, District 7. Good to see so many great candidates from other districts here. And I am running as a gig worker, drag artist, uh, spouse of an 802 member, because we need to prioritize all New Yorkers, and that includes our performing artists. That's way more than five words. I apologize. <laughs> hey, Kristen Richardson. Hi, yes, it's, it's actually Kristen Richardson Jordan. It's a long one. Uh, but I sometimes go by KRJ or just Kristen for Harlem. I'm running for New York City Council District 9, uh, which is Central Harlem. And I'm on a mission to disrupt the district with radical love, uh, community care, and service. Thank you for uh, correcting us on your name. Thank you. Uh, Angela Fernandez. Hi, my name is Angela Fernandez and I'm running for District 10, Washington Heights, Inwood and Marble Hill. And uh, I am running because we deserve dignity and justice for all and especially for those in our um, uh, arts world. And Carmen De La Rosa. Hi, I'm Carmen De La Rosa. I'm also running for District 10 in Upper Manhattan and my puppy is barking in the background. Um, I'm running because it's time for us to start putting people first, and that includes workers who have not been included in the recovery of our city or of our state. Thank you. So we are dog-friendly people here. Uh, so extra love for this panel. Uh, we're going to start off with a video question from a member of our community on a topic that you are all very passionate about. So we'll start there. Hi, my name is Stephen Ali Girgis. I'm a playwright, actor, screenwriter, a lifelong New Yorker. And my question for the candidates are, how committed are you to uh, pursuing the idea of uh, commercial rent stabilization and rent control? Um, other cultures and other great cities across the world preserve their, their, uh, their culture. Um, and uh, we need to preserve ours. Uh, I am uh, an arts advocate, but I'm not speaking for me. I'm speaking in generally, in general. We need the bookstore. We need the hot dog place as much as we need the theater. Thank you. Fantastic playwright who wrote one of my favorite plays between Riverside and Crazy. Uh, so you'll each have two minutes to respond. And remember our screen manager will be making liberal use of the mute button. So when a candidate goes over time, you'll experience that. Many of our members live in District 10, Washington Heights, Inwood, Marble Hill, and are greatly concerned about the loss of affordable living space in their neighborhood, the ending of the eviction moratorium, which is right around the corner and terrifying, and too many empty storefronts. So let's start uptown with Carmen De La Rosa. Thank you for the question. Um, and I think the member who asked the question put it best. We are experiencing mass displacement, especially in District 10, uh, that has one of the largest rent stabilized housing stocks um, in the state of New York. But also we are seeing that our commercial uh, small businesses are closing their doors um, at exorbitant speed. The pandemic has only unleashed a problem that existed in our community that has existed in our communities for decades. Uh, I fully support commercial rent uh, stabilization, commercial uh, rent 
lost because I believe that the only ways that we can keep our small businesses uh, operating and keep our culture intact is by protecting our small businesses. Um, that is a central part of why we are running for city council. You know, I grew up in a household where my father was a bodeguero, a grocery store owner in the Bronx. And I know how hard it is to keep a business open. When we choose to um, displace communities and we also displace small businesses, we are taking away from the fabric that makes our community vibrant. And so I am fully committed. I look forward to serving and I look forward to, if lucky enough to be elected, to serve on the small business committee to also make sure that this is a reality for our city. Great, Angela Fernandez, same question. Thank you. I absolutely support the commercial rent stabilization uh, law. Um, uh, there is a bill introduced by another city council member, um, and I understand that it has to be done in partnership uh, with Albany. And so uh, my extensive experience um, uh, having run a, a human rights agency um, uh, has allows me to have a bird's eye view on how the state works and how the city and the state can partner on this. Um, additionally, uh, our rent stabilization apartments are also uh, being depleted. They're falling out of rent stabilization. There's a loophole that big employers use uh, where they are allowed to rent out a rent stabilized apartment to an employee and therefore lift the rent up out of rent stabilization. And that then once that employee leaves, that housing, then that apartment stays outside of rent stabilization. That loophole needs to be changed. That needs to be shut. Um, uh, additionally, we already have a lot of good laws on the books, but our agencies are not funded to be able to enforce those laws. So for example, the tenant harassment that happens, it's not just exclusive to residents, it's exclusive. It also happens to commercial tenants. If our agencies were fully funded to be able to go and investigate and prosecute these cases, this would actually help people stay in their homes and it would actually help commercial tenants stay on, uh, in their storefronts. Those are just a couple of examples. There's a lot that can be done, but th that's what that's what I would want to propose in these two minutes. Thank you. Let's move to KRJ. Yeah, thank you. I would, well, I'm going to start by saying that I'm definitely for universal rent stabilization, including commercial rent stabilization. Uh, I will be honest in also saying that I think the time for, for really taking action and preserving our heritage and history and culture here in District 9 in Central Harlem uh, was years ago. You know, I'm not saying it's too, it's not too late, uh, but, but like the, the foundation has been shook. So we really do need to act quickly um, to preserve that art and culture and, and heritage and history that is Central Harlem. Uh, a lot of people know about my Harlem platform. Uh, it spells out Harlem. The A is actually affordable housing. Uh, but what many folks don't know is that for each part of my platform, I have 11 policy steps. And I won't go through all 11, but I will put it in the chat um, around keeping housing affordable and with that commercial tenants as well. Uh, I want to add that I am calling for a land value tax, uh, which I think is part of, of the need to keep people here uh, is that we also need to lower the costs. And so if we had a land value tax on the vacant properties, it would one, increase revenue so that we could do more service and community care, uh, but it would also motivate those who are landlords to put in commercial tenants instead of leaving spaces vacant. Thank you. Marty Ellen Cummings. Thank you so much. This is actually one of the first policy platform issues we we posted because uh you know the crisis of small businesses shuttering has been way before the pandemic and now it's exacerbated because of the pandemic because we have rising rent we have uh landlords who are keeping spaces vacant waiting for you know a chase bank who can afford to come in but the beauty of uptown manhattan is we thrive off of our local businesses. And I always tell people nothing against an Applebee's, but I want to support my local restaurant. I want to go to the pet store across the street. I've never bought a tape measure before. I just bought one the other day at the local hardware store because I wanted to support that business. So commercial rent stabilization is crucial to our, our city and supporting these businesses, which also support our arts industries. Because where do we go when we, when we go to the theater? We, we go to our local restaurant or our coffee shop. 
uh, people stay in the hotels and take taxis. So there's a huge uh, 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 variety of industries that benefit from our arts industry. So we need commercial rent stabilization. We need to penalize landlords who keep these spaces vacant, not let them get away with it. And we need to make sure that we're prioritizing our tenants. Columbia University is creeping into our district further and further displacing people. So uh, in addition to the commercial rent stabilization, we need to make sure we're prioritizing our low income and our mixed income uh, housing so people are able to keep their homes. Housing is a right. The opportunity to have a small business is a right. And uh, so we need to prioritize women-owned businesses, LGBTQIA plus owned businesses, and, and uh, BIPOC owned businesses. And our campaign a couple weeks ago launched our reparations fund, which would help our, our, uh, our uh, BIPOC community have access to not only home ownership, but small business ownership. So our communities can continue to thrive and survive. And that it has to be a part of uh, not just our recovery plan from the pandemic, but our plan for a city that works for the everyday people of the city, not, not the Jeff Bezoses who I don't give a flip about. I wanna work for the everyday people. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey Omura, you're up next. Well, first off, I wanna thank Stephen for the question uh, and, and let him know that my personal favorite play of his is Our Lady of 121st Street. Uh, I think commercial rent tax is absolutely necessary, but it's just one part of the overall puzzle. We've been, you know, we've had this small business crisis here on the Upper West Side for years, and what we've been trying has not been working. We have all of these vacant storefronts in Columbus, Amsterdam, and Columbus. So I've spent the last three months introducing myself to the business owners here in the district to get a better idea of what they're facing. And everybody says it is the rent. It's the rent that's killing them. I talked to a gym owner who's half a million dollars in in debt right now, just in past due rent. And he's never going to be able to dig his way out of that. So we're going to need a lot of help from the state and the federal government to get these, uh, these business owners out of debt. They need relief and they need relief right now. We need to take a look at our property taxes. Uh, New York City collects 47% of its overall revenue in the form of property taxes. Of course, those property taxes get passed down to the small businesses. So when we're talking about why they can't afford these rents, well, let's Take a look at these property taxes. We've got this commercial rent tax for stores south of 96th Street. So when you look at these vacant storefronts, maybe you know we could cut them a break on the commercial rent tax so that they can compete with Bank of America and Dwayne Reed. They also tell me they're struggling with regulations. I believe these regulations are there for a good reason to keep us all safe. Let's make it as easy as possible for absolutely anyone to navigate those regulations. So we can create a one-stop shop, a, a single point of contact customer service liaison, where they have one phone number to call, one agent to talk to, to walk them through all of the regulations from compliance and insurance and food safety and liquor licenses, everything they need to know. That way, absolutely anyone could start and maintain a business. But while we've got all these vacant storefronts, especially here in, the in my neighborhood, let's fill them up. As artists and arts institutions, space is our most valuable resource. That is why it is so difficult to be an artist in this city because space is so expensive. Well, coming out of this pandemic, we have more space than we know what to do with. It is now the city's responsibility. You hit the time, sorry, Jeffrey. Uh, we'll have another chance to talk. Uh, everyone will get another question to answer, but we're gonna move on to Gail Brewer for her response. Too. Thank you very, thank you very much. Well, there's no question that rent uh, stabilization, residential, and commercial are absolutely needed. Angela knows uh, better than I do in terms of the employee, but we also have a warehousing problem. These owners on the residential side are trying to get around the great state bill that uh, Carmen and others passed by warehousing. So that's something that on the residential side we absolutely have to deal with. But on the commercial side, it's even harder. The residential needs attorneys, they need um, you know, ways that people stay in their apartments, but the residential is harder. And I hate 7-Eleven and all of the national chains. Everybody knows that. So the question is, what do you do? And you're absolutely right, it's the rent. That's the problem. And the issue there is, can we do whatever the city council is proposing or something that I'm trying to work on is some kind of arbitration on the lease so that the owner cannot kick you out and never talk to you. That is what happens. Pizza shop, sorry, you have to go. I can't even reach the owner. That's outrageous. 
That's where we have to stop. So there are ways of doing it. Either it's the exact uh, bill that's been proposed since 1980 in the city council or some kind of arbitration and mediation. So you do not have to get kicked out unless there is a discussion. The other thing is we did pass zoning on the Upper West Side. That hasn't been great, but the issue is you do not uh, get to combine storefronts. Because when you do, then you bring in, I hate to say it, the Dwayne Reese and the 7-Elevens and the national chain. So I'd like to see that across the borough. I've tried, I've not been successful, but it has kept storefronts singularly occupied, except where there is already one and you can't grandfather it out. The other thing I wanna mention is just data. I passed a bill and it says, by the end of April, it was the end of March, but by the end of April, every single storefront in the city of New York is going to be on a database because the owners of the building must do that. Uh, I'm a big believer in data. If you can't, don't have the data, you can't do the planning. I always say it's terrible in Manhattan. I don't know if it's bad in the other boroughs, but we have to have that data to be able to say, we have a crisis here. We know that, but we have to be able to have it on a database. And the other thing is um, this issue of the arts. Uh, I have to give great credit to the bid on Columbus Avenue. 10 empty storefronts, phenomenally full of art. Every single vacancy should be working. This would be an example of how to help the artists and how to help the storefronts working together because it's like what Shoshana does or other organizations. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Gail. Uh, this is a great uh, transition because we are going to turn to the arts. I want to go back to Jeffrey Omora. Uh, you are an actor and a labor rights organizer, and you've centered your campaign on a comprehensive arts platform. In two minutes, can you share how you believe your arts platform can improve the quality of life for all New Yorkers? So far too often the arts gets left out of the conversation. That's what inspired me to run for city council in the first place. We're getting left out at the federal, the state and the local level. Uh, New York City is not coming back without us, without the arts. What people don't understand is not only do we need to get the more than 100,000 arts workers back to work, we need to get the 65 million tourists who, who come to New York City because we are the global capital of arts and culture. They come here because of us and they support our hotels and our restaurants and our retail, creating countless jobs in many different industries. So as we're talking about reviving New York City, we have to start with the arts. I've got uh, a lot of ideas for how we can do that. After 9-11, the city uh, sponsored a promotional campaign and beamed it to 20 countries around the world to say Broadway's open for business. This time we've got to do that, but it has to be so much more inclusive of off-Broadway, off-off-Broadway, music, dance, museums, comedy. Uh, we need uh, to directly buy tickets to, uh, to shows and give them away to tourists as a reward for spending money in the city. We need an international festival. Like after 9-11, we created the River to River Festival downtown to lure economic activity back into lower Manhattan. And it worked. Let's do that in all five boroughs. We have incredible arts institutions throughout the city and all of our neighborhoods deserve to prosper from that economic activity. Um, we're going to have to get really creative about where we get that money. The state just got $12 billion from the federal government. A lot of that money ought to come down to New York City's arts institutions. Uh, it could come down in a number of ways through the Works Progress Administration or through direct grants um, to revive uh, the individual arts institutions. I'm also proposing working with the big media and tech companies. This has been the greatest transfer of wealth in the history of our nation. So let's go to those companies that prospered using talent developed right here in New York City's cultural institutions and say, hey, you owe a debt of gratitude to the cultural institutions that have developed that talent. Give us just 0.2% of your cash on hand to revive New York City's arts and culture sector uh, and which will in, in, you know, in turn revive the entire city. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kristen Richardson Jordan, I had planned to ask you a question about your thoughts on the cultural heritage of Harlem, but you already addressed that in a very eloquent way. So let's put it to uh, you're passionate about affordable housing, but also health care. Can you talk a little bit about your plans for affordable housing and health care uh, for the Harlem community? Two minutes. 
Uh, yes, definitely, definitely. Um, so I, I'll start by saying that I am the daughter of doctors. Uh, so I have a very um, uh, a concrete look on health and health outcomes. Uh, my mother actually specializes in healthcare disparities and, um, and she's actually been at the forefront of talking about COVID and racial disparities as the results from COVID. Um, so I actually had her on my Insta Live a couple times, uh, encouraging the community to get tested, to get vaccines, um, and to just talk about overall community health. Um, my L in the Harlem platform stands for living longer, and it is a care package for Harlem seniors, but it's also uh, about health and wellness for Harlem community, and it connects to a lot of other things. So, I mean, one of the things I would love to see, especially as a teaching artist, is some partnerships with the arts community and, um, and public health. And we have some of that going on, but to do that at a deeper level, to engage in addressing obesity levels in the community with, you know, say dance, you know, to engage in uh, education around healthy eating and address Harlem's food deserts uh, with some very creative advertising, along with more funding and support for our community fridges um, and for initiatives like a local farmer's market, uh, developing that more. Uh, we have some of that too, but developing that more, especially here in, in heart of District 9. I want to um, I really want to see us look at health uh, it, as it's been affected by white supremacy. It's absolutely connected. Um, and I talk about that a lot. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that connects it, it, you know, it's all intertwined, right? So we can talk about the high asthma rates in Harlem. The high asthma rates relate to the old NYCHA housing stock, which is a housing issue and a health concern. And at its root has to do with the white supremacist nature of just warehousing a whole bunch of black bodies in these houses to begin with. So, um, so we have a lot to address in, in the realm and space of healthcare disparities. And, um, and I'm definitely up for the task. Uh, I will go ahead and do uh, what I... Oh, okay. There's just too much to talk about. Uh, Angela Fernandez. You've worked with State Senator Jose Hirano, Serrano, who now chairs the State Committee on Cultural Affairs. You've also served as the commissioner of the New York State Division of Human Rights, investigating abuses of vulnerable communities, which is a big overlap with the artistic community. And you've served on the New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board, which is the agency that investigates and prosecutes complaints of police brutality. How have these experiences shaped your agenda for the New York City Council? Uh, Angela Fernandez, you have two minutes. Sure, thank you. And actually, I didn't work with um, the senator. I worked with his father, uh, the um, uh, congressman. I was his chief of staff. Thanks. No, 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 no problem at all. And so I, I have experience at the federal level, at the state level, and at the city level, um, uh, as you can see. The, you know, the way that it has shaped um, uh, you know, the, my run for the city council and what I think that we can do is that I, I have seen that actually there are so many links between all of those levels. And number one, in unle unlocking resources that could be brought um, uh, to the district. Um, as, uh, as on the CCRB, I was able to see up close, you know, part of the, the deficiencies of the CCRB. Um, uh, but what I was also able to see was, you know, unfortunately, um, the way in which um, a police brutality would extend into the arts. Um, and into creativity. Uh, you know, there are um, uh, carnival folk workers um, uh, that would practice um, on, on the street and get harassed by the police. Um, uh, of course, graffiti as well um, uh, is something that, you know, would be an entree uh, to police um, uh, brutality. And so definitely from the CCRB, the change there is that final rule needs to rest with the CCRB, not with the commissioner, where the commissioner can just throw out charges that the CCRB provides. From the um, uh, Division of Human Rights perspective, where I ran a 200 person agency and um, within a year was able to make the agency be much more aggressive in its application of the um, oldest anti-discriminatory law in the country. Um, as a city council member, I would ensure that we allocate 
funding for the city division of human rights, where when they have the resources to be able to help people stay in their homes because they're being discriminated against because they're marginalized. And, you know, unfortunately, um, because our society does not respect the arts, many people who are in the arts are marginalized and, um, and then find themselves um, in the crosshairs of, of abusive um, either landlords or abusive employers. Um, so I would work, you know, diligently to get more resources there and um, uh, do a, you know, public education campaign around that. And one of the things also that I want to add um, is that um, uh, this, the government has really interesting resources that can be used. For example, we have independent theaters that depend on ticket sales. I think that the city should allocate money for free marketing on buses, on subways, um, but not advertising the broadways, but advertising the off-Broadway productions um, uh, and helping drive ticket sales um, uh, that way. That's just one example of the many different ways we can leverage government. And that's the experience that I got from those positions. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Gail Brewer. Turning back to you, you're running to return to District 6, the seat you held for 12 years before becoming the Manhattan Borough President. In the West Side RAG, you said one thing you can do as a council member is not repeat some of the mistakes of the past. Now, that statement was in regards to affordable housing, which you've talked about a little bit already. But this pandemic has highlighted multiple crises of inequality that have been decades in the making. So in two minutes, what do you think is the biggest mistake of the past and what can we do differently going forward? And that's for Gail. Oh, I think you're muted. Yeah, yeah no, it's big, sorry. Education is one of them. Education, um, students have been out a year and a half. My kids are older, but I know so many. Um, we had no devices, we had no technology, we had no internet. Just to start with, what are we doing in 2021 not to have those kinds of support mechanisms? So the schools and broadband. Broadband is coming to the state and then to the city. What in the world are we going to do with it that makes sense for people on the ground, but also for the theaters and for businesses and for the schools? I'm going to focus on the schools. Second thing in terms of and the mistakes of the schools, we don't often have after school. We don't have social workers. I don't know how these families are going to survive without those kinds of supports. And we won't even talk about early childhood, early childhood education. So I would say one of the challenges there are many to do differently is education. Then you can also talk about equity. There's a lot to deal with the schools. I think the second thing are the jobs. We have not just on the west side, but across the city, an awful lot of people who don't have college degrees. And even if they do, we have 400,000 people we have to get back to work, 400,000 people. Are we doing WPA? Are we doing, uh, could be in the arts? Are we, what are we doing? How are we making sure that the jobs of the future fit those who are unemployed? And we haven't done a good job in the past. Can we redo, can we look at it differently? I love the community colleges. They should be free and they should be available to make sure that these individuals have the opportunity to get the jobs of the future. We can talk about what those jobs are. Um, I, I don't want to just talk about uh, housing, but needless to say, now we have tons of buildings that are not going to be used. Let me give you an example, the hotels. Hotels could be converted to senior housing, affordable senior housing. Take this pandemic and make sure that they don't go to the highest bidder from someplace else use this distressed property to be something that can be used for the future for affordable housing. Those are just some, some issues. I, I, of course, we always, we're not just in the arts because we feel strongly about it, but also look at a different perception of the arts. And uh, we know that the controller came out with a report. We have to keep moving because we're running out of time for this panel. Um, next up is Marty Allen Cummings in District 7 as a performer and advisor on the New York City Nightlife Advisory Board. You are passionate about performing arts in New York City. Can you please tell us about your experience partnering with city agencies and how you see the role of the city in supporting indie theater artists? Two minutes. Well, I'll say I, so I've been a drag queen for over 10 years and I got that career because I was cast in a show in a small, in, like 20 seat theater and it changed my life. So independent theaters literally gave me the career I have. 
and I'm so grateful and indebted. So working on the Nightlife Council has given me an opportunity to work with our, uh, uh, I can't remember who mentioned it, but earlier uh, talking about our comedy clubs, our, our nightclubs, our, our restaurants that have musicians. So we need in our budget on the city and the state level to prioritize gig workers and performance spaces. I love the idea of giving resources. So not just the multi-million dollar Broadway shows are getting advertised, but our small venues are getting the resources they need to advertise and give artists, give restaurants who can't afford to pay artists right now because of the pandemic, put up a grant program so they can work, expand the open culture program that, that uh, Jimmy Van Bramer just passed and give grants to restaurants where they can pay performers a living wage to get their shows up and running because the tip bucket isn't cutting it. We need to fund our artists and our gig workers. We need to pass the New York Health Act because so many of our artists and our independent theater workers don't have access to health care. Health care is a human right. Housing is a human right. Education is a human right. And arts education has to be prioritized in our schools and our after school programs. And working as a gig worker, working on the Nightlife Council has not only given me that firsthand experience, but has shown me how we can get this done. We have $92 billion in the New York budget. No excuses. Let's work for the people. Brilliant. <laughs> this is hard. Oh. <laughs> uh, Carmen De La Rosa, thank you for your patience. Um, you are currently representing New Yorkers as a state assembly member, where you are the lead sponsor on Bill A5092, establishing a tax on billionaires living in New York. In two minutes, uh, tell us how you would prioritize the funds raised from a tax the rich program and what your priorities would be for other reforms that would benefit New York City's independent artists. Well, thank you for the question. I hate to follow Marty because his energy is just unparalleled, um, but I love Marty. Thank you for, for like energizing us tonight. Um, so I just wanna say that part of taxing billionaires and millionaires in New York City is not just about rhetoric. It's about upending a system that has left people behind. Um, and the wealth gap in New York and in New York State, New York City continues to expand and expand. During the darkest days of our state, we saw that billionaires, the cumulative 120 billionaires in New York City built and accumulated an enormous amount of wealth while our communities died, went hungry, made bread lines and had no one to bail them out. Enough of bailing out corporations, it's time to bail out the people. I think that art is included um, and, is, and, is a, and is a central component of the people, especially um, indie theaters where um, are strictly run, created spaces by artists. Um, so I think that for me, it's about meeting unmet needs, historic unmet needs. The funding in our education system, as Marty mentioned, making sure that arts is a given, not a special as our children call them, right? Like my daughter's always like, I have a special. It shouldn't be a special. It should be provided um, within the framework of education. In housing, when we look at what is happening to the artistic community in New York, they're forced to live doubled up, tripled up, you know, with other people because there is just not affordable housing for them. And they're discriminated against as people who may not have stable income. Um, when we talk about the unemployment and access to employment that is happening in our community, filling the gaps there. So this is about not putting bandages on open wounds that have been sucking the life out of our communities. And it's about investing and reinvesting in people. I think that as you mentioned, um, the arts community in District 10 in Upper Manhattan is the lifeblood of, of our city and of our local economy. And so they must be prioritized. And I look forward to being able to do that in the city council. Thank you so much. This panel is so rich. I wish I could spend more time with all of you. You are all incredibly passionate uh, about representing your districts. I'm gonna ask you one question. It's gonna be a lightning question. You're just gonna give me one word, answer. Um, in the survey, Kristen, Richard, Kristen Richardson Jordan said that she would lobby other council members to use their discretionary funds to support local nonprofit arts organizations. Tell me specifically one word, how you would prioritize your discretionary spending. Uh, start with Kristen Richardson-Jordan. Well, so 
I mean, I already said it. <laughs> uh, but I would support I would support local artists and and particularly teaching artists and uh, the Black Arts Movement, uh, which is still here and alive in Harlem. Great, thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, just just a few blocks from where I live, we've got the Amsterdam Houses, a very large NYCHA development. It's on the the backside of Lincoln Center. Lincoln Center was built like a fortress and was not built for the residents of the Amsterdam houses. So I would use the discretionary funding to create program, artist arts programming specifically for the Amsterdam houses. Great. Angela, discretionary funding. As Angela Fernandez. You're on mute. That's, that was, oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, I did, um, I hosted um, a Calling All Artists um, uh, Zoom meeting. Uh, we had um, uh, almost, I think it was 40 or 50 artists from District 10, resoundingly. Um, what people need, what artists need is space. So I would use the discretionary funding um, to provide free or low cost space for artists to be able to either create their art or to practice their, their performances. Great. Marty, how would you send your discretionary funding? Uh, I, I, I'm a big believer in an equitable distribution of resources and making sure that we're funding uh, those who are left out. I think Carmen just said it. It's, we don't need to be funding corporations and the rich. So money needs to go, like I, I said earlier, into our school arts programs, into our senior arts programs to help our aging community uh, tap into their creative juices as well and make sure that we're using, I think Jeffrey had mentioned this and Gail also, having our empty storefronts become spaces for artists, providing resources. We have the funds, we have the resources and it's about where, who are we prioritizing? So equitable distribution of resources, that is not, that's more than one word, but there you go. <laughs> And cameo by a very cute running mate. Just oh, thank you. <laughs> he was barking. <laughs> I had to pick him up. <laughs> Carmen, let's finish up with you. How do you send your discretionary funding? Um, sure. Similar to what the colleagues have said, just an equitable distribution. I don't see discretionary money as seed money for a one-off. I see it as the building blocks to empower the people in our community. And that's how it should be used. I definitely agree that space is um, at a at a major is a major point where people really want access to this space, and I look forward to working with the colleagues here to make sure that we make this the New York the reality that this New York the reality that people need. Thank you. Thank you so much, panelists. I'm so glad you could all come and spend some time with us this evening. We're going to transition to the next panel, and while that's happening, Marco will be performing for everyone, but please take a moment to drop your campaign information in the chat. Thank you.